As we switch out, uh, we're going to transition now to the Department of Energy's uh, Arctic priorities. As many of you know and have seen, uh, the Department of Energy uh, has been quite, more, uh, quite a bit more uh, evident in, in the Arctic, uh, not just in the Arctic, but also talking about the Arctic here in Washington, D.C. So we asked the Deputy Secretary if he would uh, lend us some time today to talk about uh, the uh, Department's vision and mission for the Arctic and how that fits into the work we all do. And to introduce the Secretary, once again, please welcome to the podium the Chair of the United States Arctic Research Commission, Fran Ulmer. Fran? Thank you very much. And I don't know about all of you, but this has been a fabulous day so far. I hope you're all taking notes and being prepared to carry back to your various homes, offices, organizations, institutions, some of what you are learning here today. Uh, we are very pleased to have the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Energy with us. So uh, Dan Briette, Briette, I'm going to get this right yet, Dan Briette uh, has had a distinguished career in business. He has been a businessman at USAA, at the Ford Motor Company. He's had a number of distinguished positions with government, including Chief of Staff on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. He has been a former state energy regulator in Louisiana. We were just talking about New Orleans, uh, where he was born and raised. And he has spent time in San Antonio, Texas, which means he also knows the oil and gas industry. And I might just note, seeing that, um, you know, from Alaska, we always have to do this. He once lived in a state that was half the size of Alaska. <laughs> so without further ado, please welcome Secretary Dan Briette. Sorry, Thank I just you, had to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Rick Perry's heard that once or twice, too. <laughs> he's, he's always, uh, he and the Alaska delegation are always ribbing each other about the size of the state. It's fun to watch. Coming from Louisiana, oof, we live in a little small town. We pretend to be big every now and then, but uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here today. It's a, it's a sincere honor. Uh, for me to be with all of you, and it's an honor to be here uh, with the Wilson Center, uh, one of the country's preeminent leading centers for Arctic policy research. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Department of Energy, I'll, I'll just restate what our core mission is, and that is to ensure America's security and prosperity by addressing its energy, environmental, and nuclear challenges through what we hope is and we know is transformative science and technology solutions. And I think this mission dovetail, dovetails perfectly uh, with today's program. I heard some of the conversation as I was walking in here, so I'll start this off with a, maybe a bit of a controversial uh, comment. Unlike China, the United States is an Arctic nation. And increasingly, our energy interests in the Arctic are not only a Department of Energy priority for all of us, but it's also a national priority. Simply put, energy is central uh, to the economic development and prosperity of the Arctic. And it wasn't all that long ago that many believed that all of the Earth's energy potential had been explored. And that belief led us down to a point of view, a path, if you will, uh, in a philosophy that was known as peak oil. And coming from Louisiana, uh, I was very familiar with this and very interested in it. But we all know what the rest of the story is, or the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, and I guess that probably dates me. But um, thanks to innovation and to hard work, we have discovered an energy abundance, both in the US and around the world, that is so large, many people can't even begin to imagine it. The Arctic is part of that story, and it represents this untapped potential. By some estimates, up to one-third of the world's natural resources are currently hidden in the Arctic, putting it at the forefront of opportunity and of abundance. It accounts for 13% of the world's undiscovered oil, 30% of undiscovered gas, and it has an abundance of uranium, rare earth materials, and millions of miles of untapped resources. Now, recognizing this incredible potential, our administration is committed to leveraging those resources in environmentally responsible ways. And in fact, just last year, Congress and the administration took a major step 
to open up Alaska's 1002 area for responsible energy development. This was a vital step forward, and it was more than a decade in making. I can remember as a young assistant secretary at DOE working on this project unsuccessfully, I might add, over 15 years ago. But through the careful expansion of oil and natural gas production, Alaska can continue to feed America's energy independence while improving the state's economy and helping us, all Americans, meet the energy needs of our partners and our allies all around the world. And DOE will play a vital role in making this happen. As some of you already know, because I, know, I see many Navy folks here, you've already worked with DOE. DOE is the world's largest scientific organization with thousands of scientists and researchers in 17 national laboratories. And we've partnered with Alaska for decades to explore energy challenges and some of our efforts are beginning to pay real dividends. Let me give you a few examples of those. DOE is researching methane hydrates at a test site in Alaska to better understand their formation and importantly, their extraction. It's exciting work because it could be a major source of energy for every maritime country. Meanwhile, we know that despite the vast energy resources in the Arctic, heat and electricity delivery to remote regions relies on extremely expensive diesel generation and home heating oil, which as we also know, siphons out resources from these local economies, and it's to the detriment of many rural communities. To help address this high cost of electricity in Alaska, DOE has worked with Alaskans to deploy renewables through grants provided by the DOE's Office of Indian Energy and through R&D projects that translate discovery into real-world impact. And very specifically, we're collaborating with communities in the Arctic to understand how microgrids can become platforms for integrated energy systems, bringing together renewable sources, resources, with energy storage to decrease energy costs and emissions as well. An example of this work is DOE's partnership with the city of Cordova and the University of Alaska Fairbanks through three of our national laboratories. This partnership, which is sponsored by our Grid Modernization Lab Consortium, is investigating the integration of energy storage, electric vehicles, and the Cordova hydro-based microgrid. Alaskans have led the way, and they have been pioneers in the development and operation of these hybrid microsystems, and it's our hope at DOE that we can continue to be part of the Arctic's efforts to identify long-term energy solutions that make a real difference in the lives of the people who call the Arctic home. In addition to the applied research that I just mentioned, um, we have other challenges that face Arctic communities, and DOE conducts basic research on the ecosystems and the science underlying this vital region. DOE has played an important role in understanding the changes to the Arctic environment through a major Office of Science project called the Next Generation Ecosystems Experiments. We know that the Arctic's landscape is changing in ways that will provide new economic opportunities, but it will also pose, and I know that you've discussed this, new national security challenges as well. DOE is also playing a role in addressing this unique challenge through our work in, the naval operation, in naval operations as the designers and builders of our naval nuclear propulsion systems. For those of you who haven't worked with DOE, every, every Navy submarine and every Navy aircraft carrier, nuclear-powered ship, um, has a propulsion system that we help design and in many cases help build. Through this program, we are proud to power U.S. Navy ships and submarines in the Arctic and support the fantastic research that is conducted by the men and women of our Navy complex in the biennial I I ICE-X. This exercise, which I hope to participate in soon, is essential to our understanding our operational capabilities in the Arctic Ocean under changing sea ice conditions. So I hope you can see that DOE is already engaged in the important work that's being done in the Arctic. But we do realize that even more needs to be done. And to chart the future of DOE's Arctic activities, 
several of our DOE leaders, along with the leadership of 12 of our national laboratories and thought leaders from across Alaska participated in Alaska National Laboratory Day. This important conference, and it is a very important conference, is hosted by the University of Alaska Fairbanks and Senator Murkowski. And we explored the areas of greatest opportunity for energy, for environment, and for national security research and development. And we look forward to further developing the creative ideas that we are receiving and are generated through these and through future discussions. However, we do understand that this can't be a one-way conversation. We understand that any plans for the region will require close coordination with our other, with other Arctic nations. Our opportunities and our challenges are also shared by our Arctic neighbors. And all of us at DOE are committed to finding common ground and working together for our mutual benefit. I'll give you an example of that. We are excited by the shared opportunities that we have to explore the vast resources, including cr critical minerals of Alaska and Greenland. And in Iceland, we're learning about advanced hydro and geothermal, geothermal technology to expand our own resources here in America, in the lower 48, I guess is what you refer to it as, right, yes. Fran? <laughs> DOE and the National Laboratories will be participating in many of the international dialogues and summits, and I hope to attend some in the near future as well, to explore even further opportunities, starting with the Arctic Circle Assembly in October, followed by representation at the World Geothermal Congress, the Arctic Energy Summit, and the Iceland Supercomputing Summit, which will occur in 2020. We'll also continue our participation in the very successful Arctic Remote Networks Energy Academy, or ARENA as I know it, next year in Alaska, Canada, and Iceland. And this program is very impressive because it brings together some of the brightest minds in Arctic energy to foster some of the best practices and generate some of the most creative solutions that I've heard in my short tenure as Deputy Secretary of Energy. Now, as I mentioned earlier and as I heard you discuss, in contrast to this approach, we have seen some nations that are seeking an outsized influence in this region. Some, as I mentioned earlier, that are not even Arctic nations themselves. Secretary Pompeo spoke passionately about this not long ago at the Arctic Council meetings in Finland. And we've witnessed this phenomenon before. A few nations pursuing strategies aimed solely at promoting their own economic and geostrategic interests, where resources are often developed often in environmentally unsustainable ways, and monopolies are emboldened. The United States is no such nation. We seek to promote the economic prosperity of not just Arctic communities, but of the global community as well. And we see it as our mandate to work with Arctic nations to ensure that we all share in its bounties for decades to come. As an Arctic nation, the United States must be a leader in matters that are related to the Arctic's economy, security, resource development, and infrastructure, all the while being good stewards of the environment. To quote Secretary Pompeo, the president knows this white expanse can also be green. President Trump also knows that leading in the Arctic will require greater coordination, and at his direction, DOE is stepping up. Alaska and the Arctic more broadly are lands of great promise and great opportunity. I look forward to working with all of you as we explore avenues of cooperation, collaboration, and discovery for the good of the American people and all Arctic people. Thank you for having me today. Come join me. Is this where you're going to ask me the tough questions? No tough ones, just important <laughs> ones. <laughs> Dan, thank you very much for being here, and thank you for your expression of commitment to making certain that the vast resources that the Department of Energy has, particularly in science and in technology, can apply some of its capacity to a region that is in need. I want to tell you that about a month or so ago, I had the opportunity to go to Albuquerque and visit one of your national labs, Ooh. Sandia. Sandia, yes, yeah, sure. I learned a lot about what is happening, not just in the Arctic space, but beyond, and was incredibly impressed by the breadth and the depth 
of what it is that the Department of Energy is working on. Uh, Isn't it fascinating? It was a great couple of days, actually two days. I find it to be one of the days. most fascinating government agencies uh, at the federal level. Well, and it's something that I think most Americans and maybe most of the world uh, really doesn't know very much about. That's and I don't know, maybe maybe it's okay. <laughs> but, but I, for one, as someone who is very interested in how do we use science to solve real world problems, uh, was delighted to see the capacity there and uh, met with your Arctic team at Sandia that is heavily engaged in discussions with the University of Alaska and others to try to make the kind of partnerships that you were briefly describing. That's great. So, so let, me, let me just ask briefly, as you pointed out, we have some pretty significant challenges in regions where the population is distributed sure. and where there is a heavy reliance on a very expensive fuel called diesel. Sure. Uh, the generation of a lot of the energy, at least in rural Alaska villages, uh, unfortunately has had to and still does rely on diesel and very much interested in the kind of microgrid technology sure. that allows the use of renewables plus diesel, right, mm -hmm. for reliability sure. and backup. Sure. So uh, I, I know you said you were headed to Alaska again I this am. summer, a little bit this later. August, yeah. uh, and you know a little bit about the microtechnology, but we certainly are interested in beefing up our capacity in terms of the renewables. So my question is really, to, in, in what way do you see the innovation capacity of the Department of Energy, particularly helping in this renewable space. You mm -hmm. talked a bit about mm -hmm. the more traditional energy, but renewables, and I will also mention energy efficiency, which is sort of the low-hanging fruit, really. If you're living in a village and the price of both electricity and heat is very high, mm -hmm. uh, how can the Department of Energy help? Sure. Well, I'll tell you a little bit of what we're doing in our, in our laboratories, and I'm glad you got a chance to visit one because Fabulous. I find them to be amazing. We have 17 of them, and uh, each focus on different areas. <clears throat> Importantly, with regard to renewables, we have a, a laboratory in Golden, Colorado. It's a national renewable energy laboratory. Uh, it is almost entirely dedicated to renewable technologies, and in that laboratory is some of the most cutting-edge Work that I have ever seen in this particular field. You know, we're all familiar now with wind energy and with solar energy, and it's been um, probably 20, 25 years, 30 years, and now where it's out in the marketplace and, and fairly readily available as, as renewable energies go. What we are working on in the Department of Energy is the next generation of solar. It is the next generation of wind. We're making those technologies more efficient. So I know what you're speaking to is probably inside the home type efficiencies, but uh, we also want to make these generation um, components more efficient as well. And uh, what I saw in Golden, Colorado, uh, was some of the latest technology on solar, where you literally take a paintbrush, dip it into a paint can, and you paint your windows and they become electric generators. <laughs> How, you know, you put a wire to your window and your window produces electricity for your home. If we can make that type of technology commercially viable and bring it out into the marketplace so that, you know, small communities who may not have structures, candidly, that can hold the weight of a solar panel, or they may not have the resources to develop a wind uh, generation facility nearby to, to fuel a community, but they may have the ability to paint their windows. Um, it's a fascinating technology, but it's that type of work that we're doing inside of our national laboratories. We're also doing a lot of work with the University of Alaska on microgrids, because Alaska presents not only a challenge, but it's an opportunity for our scientists to see how these things work and what makes them work well and what makes them not work well in certain cases. And you know, you know Alaska, I don't have to tell you this, is a unique challenge because of the climate itself. If it worked in Alaska, it's very likely to work in most of the places in the United States. So we see it as a great you know, opportunity for us to learn as well. But that's some of the things that we're doing to move the renewable technologies along. But it's important for us to not forget the other types of electric generation. So what we refer to as baseload power is very important. Uh, because until we solve the battery storage question, and we're trying to do that as well in this lab and in others, uh, if we can have battery technology uh, advance another generation or perhaps two, then you may not need baseload power. You may not need those diesel generators to be available if the wind's not blowing or if the sun's not shining. Um, we're almost there, but we're not quite there. Uh, so we're working very hard on battery technology as well. 
So I hope that explains some of the some of the things we have going on within our very laboratories. Exciting. It's yeah, a very well, exciting one, place to be. One more question. I, I see Mike is already standing up, so I know we're getting close. But um, you mentioned Greenland and Iceland yes. and, and the possibilities for uh, additional work. Uh, as you know, Iceland is almost 100% renewable between mm -hmm. hydro and geothermal. And uh, obviously, they're very proud of the technology they have. And sure. I know you've visited oh, sure. uh, uh, this yeah. as well. But I'm curious, what, what do you see in terms of the potential collaboration with Greenland or with Iceland and the way in which the US, both in a what can we learn from, but also mm -hmm. can we contribute to or partner with? Sure. Any thoughts about that? Sure, I'll give you one quick example. Um, we are working on uh, turbines that are used in Iceland and other places uh, that are placed in rivers. And the river itself provides the base load power that I just mentioned, that it offsets the, uh, the wind and solar generation when those are not producing at peak capacity. Those are, those are technologies that we learned from our friends in Iceland, our friends in Greenland, our friends in Denmark and Norway as well. We spend a lot of time uh, with those folks. I just returned from France, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I just returned from Copenhagen, where I was at the Clean Energy Ministerial talking about these very types of technologies. So it's a very collaborative effort with these countries, and they're scientists as well. And we invite them to our laboratories, and we've been invited to theirs many times as well, so that we can develop these technologies together. Uh, and together, we look at each other's economy. The other important thing to this, um, it's fun to, de you know, to develop the technology and to create the new idea. Uh, it's very exciting, and it's exciting to see it go to market. But what we're learning is that it's also important for us to begin to standardize some of these technologies so that they become cheaper and that folk, you know, so that folks can afford them. They just become more widely available in the marketplace when they're standardized. If it's a one-off unique technology, folks are just less likely to take the chance or take the risk of buying it or owning it or placing it in their community. So we're working very closely with some of these other economies. The Europeans in particular have been leaders on this uh, in helping us figure out what works to standardize these types of technologies. Terrific. I see Mead Treadwell back there just itching to ask one final question <laughs> before we, uh, we let you go your way. Thank you. Mead, <coughs> go ahead. Th thank you, uh, Governor. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you for coming to Alaska and welcome back. Um, in, in this administration, the president has an energy dominance a policy, and mm -hmm. I know that even as we struggle with the question of China being a near-Arctic nation, we look at China as a vast market for American liquefied natural gas, Japan as a market, Korea as a market. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what's happening in, in U.S. Asian trade and energy negotiations that can help bring uh, North American Arctic gas to market? Sure. Um, I don't want anyone to take my comments uh, the wrong way. Uh, we invite China, we invite other nations that have um, interests in the world economy to participate, but we want people to participate in a way that respects the rights and the, the property rights and intellectual property rights in particular of all the market participants. So we welcome their participation, but we want their participation to be uh, respectful of the other participants in the marketplace. That being said, the trade conversations that are ongoing and being led by Ambassador Lighthizer uh, are going well. And I suspect that very soon we're gonna see some major trade announcements being made uh, between our two countries that are gonna be a fair uh, and equitable agreement between our two nations. Uh, when that happens, we expect that natural gas sales uh, in China will increase. Right now, they're, uh, they're not a significant portion if, of U.S. LNG sales uh, at the moment, but I suspect that that will increase over the years. Japan and South Korea, for those of you who are in this business, you know that those are very large markets for U.S. LNG, and uh, we expect those to continue for quite some time. I'm very excited about the project that, you know, Governor, you're working on, I know, and others are working on. Uh, with uh, respect to export uh, capabilities that may come out of Alaska. Uh, just given the vast resources there, we know that's a, an important project. But we're also just important, we're excited for Alaska uh, to develop an export facility for U.S. LNG potentially. So uh, we want to continue to work with you. We want to continue to work with JBIC and others who are also uh, interested in this project. And if there's anything that we can do to help advance that ball, uh, know that we want to. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for joining us. Thank Please you. help me say thank you. Thank you, Fran. You it's an honor to be here. You Secretary, thank you very much. Thank you. I really thank appreciate you. it.
Thank you, Frank. No, you're all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Fran.